The recording will be archived and it will be available later this week. Um, so tell your friends who couldn't make it that they could look at the recording. Um, the camera and the microphone will be oriented to the front of the room, but sometimes as an audience member, if you make a contribution, um, your question will probably be recorded as well, as well as the conversation. So again, uh, it's, it's great to see all of you here, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to uh, have visiting with us Professor, Professor Shlomo Vinner and his wife, Hava, um, who is also a mathematics educator, uh, retired. Um, but Shlomo just doesn't believe in retirement. <laughs> um, he, he, uh, some of you may not know this, but, but he began, um, I guess he's a mathematician, and he was a faculty member at Hebrew University for a long time. And those of you who um, have read his papers know about his earlier work. Much of that earlier work has to do with learning of advanced mathematical ideas or calculus ideas and things like concept image and whatever. He worked with other wonderful math ed researchers. I wanted you to know that we're going to have a conversation at my home tomorrow evening, or tomorrow late afternoon evening, 3.30 to 6.30, where my doctoral students know about it. And of course, anyone else who wants to come is welcome. And if you want directions, you just email Marjorie. She has them ready to be sent if you want to have those directions. So I've known Professor Venner for a long time through our variety of professional organizations, but probably more closely, he was a very, very close friend of the late Robert B. Davis. And we had many wonderful visits and conversations together. And of course, his, his PME uh, plenary lecture in Finland will always be memorable. I don't know if anyone here heard that lecture. Um, you're all so young, I guess. What year was that, Shlomo? 97. 97, that's not that long ago. But, but Shlomo retired from Hebrew University. Not very long, because uh, Miriam Ahmed immediately recruited him to Beersheba. And he was now a mathematics educator, where he developed a program for secondary teaching. Didn't he? Was it? In middle schools. Junior high and secondary. Yeah. And so he worked there for a while, and again, supposedly retired. He sort of retired a second time. And then here he's back at Hebrew University, and, and they recruited him to develop a program for elementary math teacher education. So we have lots of things to talk about. But what you probably all don't know is that he's a poet. He's a published poet. He writes wonderful poetry. And uh, his um, other application is also music. I can remember, of course, the wonderful tours. I was delighted to get the tour twice, once with uh, Alice visiting uh, Jerusalem, and the second time with my husband visiting Jerusalem, where you took us to all these wonderful places, and all of the music that we heard, you knew so well and pointed out that music, so that those memories are very precious, and I should not forget them. So I'm really thrilled that you're here making your way to the West Coast to visit daughter and grandchildren, making a stop in New York, so we're very fortunate. Welcome, Shlomo. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. And, uh, I'll uh, start immediately. Uh, by saying that uh, although this is a mathematics education form. I have chosen to introduce myself as a science educator rather than mathematics educator. The reason for this is that <coughs> I consider mathematics as part of science. And uh, it is also because all sciences, including social sciences, use mathematics. In order to develop the theory, and also the structure is quite similar to the structure of mathematical theories, namely the deductive structure. As an introduction, I would like to elaborate on some notions in the title of my talk. Scientific theory is a theory which explains phenomena in our world, and in most cases, is supported by experiments or facts. A scientific theory can be refuted and, on 
the other side, there's also the notion of pseudoscience. A pseudoscience looks like a science, but essentially cannot be uh, refuted. Some examples of pseudosciences are psychoanalysis, some parts of biological evaluation and evolution, and religious explanations to phenomena in our world, particularly the creationist theory. Two, religious thinking. Explains the world relying on religious texts. One of the most common explanations relies on the claim that things are the result of God's will, the Creator's will. Three, science education is an ambiguous notion. <coughs> On one hand, it denotes the act of teaching science to students and related activities such as curriculum development, writing science textbooks, computer software, etc. On the other hand, it is a research discipline which investigates thought processes of students learning science of teachers teaching science. Four, by the term secular, I mean somebody who does not believe that God exists. For me, the term secular has the same meaning as atheist. Unfortunately, the term atheist has a negative connotation. It is not politically correct. Therefore, many atheists avoid declaring themselves as atheists. They prefer to appear as pantheists. Pantheism is the belief that the universe, the totality of, ev totality of everything, is identical with God. This idea is due to the Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza. Nevertheless, since I believe that political correctness is very often the enemy of truth, I will use atheism in this talk just to clarify the distinction between religious people and secular people. Fine. <coughs> the viewpoint of science educator in this talk is the viewpoint of somebody <coughs> who tries to understand the thinking of religious people. Six, the religions which I will discuss are Judaism and Christianity. From time to time, while being involved in theological discussions with my gentle friends, I remind them that Jesus was Jewish <laughs> and was strongly influenced by the Jewish conception of life and the world. Other religions, which I hardly know, like Islam and Far East religions will be mentioned shortly and superficially. Seven, science education is interdisciplinary. It borrows various tools from cognitive psychology, the psychology of problem solving, sociology, <laughs> sociology philosophy of science, and theology. It is not supposed to make innovations in those disciplines. Thus, in this talk, I'm borrowing from those disciplines. I'm not intending to make any innovations. The purpose of this talk is to explain how scientific thinking, as well as religious thinking, can help us to cope with our daily problems, physical and psychological. In my opinion, our main problems are health, mortality, and suffering. I'll start with the scientific thought. Scientific thought offers us, among other things, ways to cope with our health problems, and it includes ways to deal with our physical pain. And scientific thought also offers us explanations about the physical world. 
from the moment it was created till present. It gave us the magnificent edifice of natural sciences, which is also the basis of medicine and technology. However, science does not help us to cope with our psychological problems mentioned above, mortality and suffering. My main source for religious thinking will be the Bible, which also explains how the world was created and how all what we see here came into being. So let's start, let's start with the religious explanation to the creation, namely with Genesis chapter 1. At the end of six-day work, God was quite satisfied. God saw everything that had made, and behold, it was very good. As a matter of fact, God was the only one who was satisfied. Adam and Eve were not cognitively ready to make any evaluation of the st this stage. Why? Because they had not eaten from the tree of knowledge, good and evil. At this point, they were not aware of their mortality. God was aware, but God did not think it was negative. However, Adam and Eve realized their mortality after eating from the tree of knowledge, and they thought it was horrible. This takes me immediate, immediately to Ecclesiastes. It is the most pessimistic book which I know. <laughs> it is pessimistic because of the writer's understanding that he is mortal. If I have to pick up a typical quotation from Ecclesiastes, I will choose chapter 9, uh, verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> a living dog is better off than a dead lion. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Their love and, and hate and the jealousy have long since vanished. The mortality situation leads us to the following million dollar question. If we are eventually die, why are we born for? And if we are born, What's the point of ending our life? Is there a way to solve this dilemma? Well, there's a simple solution. It is based on the distinction between body and soul. It is quite interesting that there is a hint to this distinction in Ecclesiastes. <laughs> and the dust returned to ground it came from, and the spirit Returns, returns to God and gave it. This is, by the way, written on the funeral homes in Jewish uh, funeral. <coughs> However, Ecclesiastic himself probably was not convinced. If I'm allowed, I would like to make a wild assumption here. Ecclesiastic has a realistic way of thinking. This is, in a way, a scientific way of thinking, namely thinking which considers facts. The idea that there is a place to which souls go after the death of the body has no support in our world. Thus, if you don't accept this idea, what is the answer to the about Miller million dollar question? The answer is quite pessimistic. Without being asked, we are born, and eventually we have to die. Can we carry on our life with this message? For many of us, it is unacceptable. This leads us to a <coughs> search of the meaning of life. Here is an accidental list of four references which deal with this question. Lemke, Feynman, 
Frankel, Yalom, and Eagert. Here is a quotation from a review about Eaglestone's book. How can an English professor and literary critic, that's Eagleton, write a philosophical brief on the meaning of life? Well, Terry Eagleton did and did it well. He takes us through the end of Victorian certainty and shows us how the and combat raised the question which a sense of urgency. Uh, that search of urgency that Jane Austen never had. In the early decades of the 20th century, T.S. Eliot and Camus and Sartre brought challenges to all our values, beliefs, and institutions. Most in the West have now accepted the view that life is an accidental evolutionary phenomenon with no intrinsic meaning. Rather than lament the loss of <coughs> part of God's design, which was often impenetrable, this clears the ground for us to give life meaning whatever we choose. A starting point it is realizing that life is not a problem to be solved. If you are being practical, it really becomes more an ethical issue than metaphysical. We should, not, we should be more concerned about what makes life worth living, what adds quality, depth, abundance, and intensity. Eagleston's suggestions point us to a direction we have heard before. Caring for others, compassion, becoming truly engaged. And that is what has occupied the great novelists, poets, and artists of all ages. And of quotation. Unfortunately, some people do not want to follow Eaglestone altruistic recommendations. Their way to cope with the evolutionary claim that life is <coughs> meaningless by just by denying it. This leads easily, or this is easily done by drinking alcohol, by smoking grass, and by using other drugs. Litai Po a Chinese poet whose poems were used by the Czech Jewish composer Gustav Mahler writes, wine is already beckoning in golden goblets, but do not drink yet. First, I'll sing you a song. What is the song? The bottom line is, dark is life, Dark is death. I think if you turn off the light, we we'll see better the uh, video. Yeah. Thank you. 
I assume uh, you have noticed the composer's anger about mortality on one hand, dark is death, and about suffering on the other hand, dark is life. I wonder whether the final drum beat has called to your mind the same association that it has called mine. Thus, if life is only suffering, what meaning does it have? Here is another question about the meaning of life, taken from the famous movie, Hair. Where do I go? Follow the river. Where do I go? Follow the ghost. Where is the something? Where is the someone? Let's tell me why I live and die. say here. However, many people make a real effort to find the meaning to their life. Here are three examples. The first one is a clip from Woody Allen's Hannah and her sister. Allen, after his medical doctor told him he did not have brain cancer, realizes that he is mortal. He returns to his secretary and tells her about his discovery and about his need to find a meaning to his life. Do you realize what a thread we're all hanging by? Mickey, you're off the hook. You should be celebrating. Can you understand how meaningless everything is? Everything I'm talking about. Our lives, the show, the whole world, it's meaningless. Yeah, but you're not dying. No, I'm not dying now, but, but you know, when I ran out of the hospital, I. I was so thrilled because they told me I was going to be all right. And I'm running down the street, and suddenly I stopped because it hit me. All right, so, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go today. I'm okay. I'm not going to go tomorrow. But eventually, I'm going to be in that position. You're just realizing this now. <coughs> I don't realize it now. I know it all the time. But, but I managed to stick it in the back of my mind because it, it's a very horrible thing to think about. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Yes. A week ago, I bought a rifle. I went to the store. I bought a rifle. I was going to, you know, if they told me that I had a tumor, I was going to kill myself. The only thing that might have stopped me, might have, is my parents would be devastated. I would, I would have to shoot them also first. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to blend them. Well, you know, eventually it, it is going to happen to all of us. Yes, but doesn't that ruin everything for you? That makes everything, you know, it, it just takes the pleasure out of everything. I mean, you're going to die, I'm going to die, the audience is going to die, the network's going to, the sponsor. I everyone. know, I know, I'm your hamster. Yes. Listen, <laughs> I think you snapped your camp. Maybe you need a few weeks in Bermuda or something. Or go to a horror house. I can't stay on the show. i got to get some answers. <laughs> okay. And here is Ellen's immediate solution to his existential problem. Now, why do you think that you would like to convert to Catholicism? Well, because, you know, I've got to have something to believe in, otherwise life is just meaningless. I understand, but why did you make the decision to choose the Catholic faith? You know, first of all, because it's a very beautiful religion, and it's, it's a strong religion, it's very well structured. You know, I'm talking now, certainly, about the, the uh, against school prayer, pro-abortion, anti-nuclear way. So at the moment you don't believe in God? No, and I, I want to. You know, I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I'll, you know, I'll dye Easter eggs if it works. I, I need some evidence. I've got to have some proof. You know what? If I can't believe in God, then I don't think life is worth living. It means making a very big leap. Well, can, can you help me? <laughs> okay, light, please. <clears throat> a relatively easy way <clears throat> to deal with the mortality <clears throat> problem is the idea of the next world. Or in Jesus' terminology, the behavior behavior the heavenly king. However, the claim about the next world is a pseudo-scientific claim. Namely, according to Popper's criterion, it cannot be refuted. Probably, this is the reason why so many uh, people who are ready to buy. 
it brings some relief to our fear to die. Besides the fear to die, <coughs> there's another problem for many people, which is the suffering problem. Especially the suffering of people who have tried to follow all the commands of God and expecting to be rewarded by God for their good deeds. Thus, by inventing the heavenly king kingdom, Jesus has killed two birds in one shot. He supposedly cured us for our fear from our fear to die. And also he promised us a huge compens compensation for our suffering. No wonder why so many people all over the world converted to Christianity. In order to overcome the danger that also Jews would adopt Christianity, the idea of the next world was adopted also by Judaism. Note that the idea of the next world does not exist in the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. Now, the existential solution of human beings is the following. We hate dying, but we also hate suffering. However, ironically enough, death can liberate us from our suffering. The question is quite simple. Which emotion is unbearable? Our fear to die or our suffering? Hence, when suffering overcomes the fear to die, suicide is recommended. Here are some examples from the Jewish history. One, King Saul committed suicide when he realized that he lost the battle with the Philistines and they were going to capture him. Second, Ahitophel committed suicide after his military recommendation was not accepted by Absalom in his rebellion against King David. Ahitophel could not bear the humiliation and he hanged him. Three, the defenders on Mount Masada and their families. They committed a collective suicide when they realized the Romans were going to win the battle and as a result, they would take him to Rome as slaves. The suicide option is also suggested by Shakespeare in Hamlet's ultimate monologue. is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of trouble and by opposing end them to die to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep. <laughs> Dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. Must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns <coughs> of time? The oppressor's wrong. The proud man's contumely. The pangs of despised love. the law's delays, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, 
when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would Fardel's bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death? The undiscovered country from whose bourne no traveler returns puzzles the world and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard their currents turn awry. And lose the name of action. Okay. <coughs> it is interesting that Shakespeare does not mention diseases as a reason for suicide. <coughs> we can wonder why that is. Is it because Shakespeare was not aware of diseases or because of literary reasons? After all, Shakespeare did not write an academic essay about reasons to commit suicide. He wrote a play. <coughs> Nowadays, many terminal patients prefer to die than to go on with the terrible suffering. However, being so helpless, they these patients cannot commit suicide by themselves. They need help. But only in few states all over the world, it's legal to help people to commit suicide. This is only, by the way, common. Hamlet <coughs> did not commit suicide because he wanted to find out what caused his father's death. Among the reasons which justify suicide in Hamlet's monologue, there is despised love. Unfortunately, it is demonstrated by Ophelia in Act 4, Scene 5. Hundred and seventy years later, also Werther, the hero of Goethe, committed suicide because of despised love. Before moving on to the next issue, I would like to remind you of two notions from the science of religions. The first one is transcendental God. The transcendental God is the God who created the world and after that he stopped being involved in events in our world. The concept of transcendental God and pantheism are almost the same in my opinion. The second notion from, is, uh, from the science of religions that I would like to use is the notion of imminent God. The imminent God is supposed to interfere with events in our world. Namely, he is supposed to reward the people who follow his commands and to punish the sinners. The situation of somebody who is convinced that he did not do anything wrong, and in spite of that he is suffering, is unbearable, and it's quite typical. There are two biblical figures that raise this problem protesting against God, Jeremiah and Job. In chapter 12 of Jeremiah, he says, you are always right as Lord when I bring a case before you, yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? <coughs> Why do all the faithless live at ease? 
Jeremiah preferred to pose his question in a general way. He did not mention that he was the one who was persecuted by the wicked. On the other hand, Job's complaint is personal. He wanted to know why he was suffering. Although also for him death was suggested as a solution by, to his suffering. It was suggested by his wife, curse God and die, she advised. Job refuses. But, this, but his general mood is the same as the mood of the prophet Jonah, who said, it's better for me to die than to live. In chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, Job says, Why did I not, why died I not from the womb? Why did I go, why did, why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees prevent me? Or why the breast that I would suck? For now, should I have lain still and been quiet? I should have slept. Then had I been at rest. And this is King James uh, translation, which I think it's awful translation, but I didn't want to, to suggest to another one because uh, it's important for the continuation. A similar mood is expressed in Psalm chapter 22. My God, my God, why hast you forsaken me? I am a war, no man. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. By the way, this sentence does not exist in the Hebrew version of Psalm 22, nor in the English version which was made by the Gideons. My assumption is that King James translator, being aware that Jesus referred to Psalm 22 while suffering on the cross, and being a good Christian, decided to add this sentence to the text because it describes accurately the crucifixion. And for Jesus, feeling he was abandoned by God, it was only natural to choose Psalm 22 to express his unbearable pain on the cross. Indeed, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Were Jesus' last words on the cross before he died. A possible answer to Jeremiah's question as well as to Job's question is that God moves in mysterious ways. This is beautifully expressed in Job's word, therefore I have uttered that I understood not. Things are too wonderful for me which I knew not. <coughs> in the book of Job, God relates to Job's complaint by the following. <coughs> Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Who marked off its dimension? Who shut up the sea behind doors? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Have you comprehended the vast expenses of the earth? If I try to formulate God's answer to Job's complaint in our daily language, it would be something like, who are you to question my ways of conducting the world? Nevertheless, in case you are not satisfied with the way the book of Job is ended, and you, will <coughs> and you, and you still want to deal with the dif difficulties it causes to the idea of an imminent God, there is another way to cope with Job's story. It is to claim that Job did not exist. It is only a story. 
But for me, as a secular reader, even if it's only a story, God doesn't come out so good from it. God bets with Satan that Job will not lose his faith, no matter what happens to him. Thus, he lets Satan destroy Job's entire property. He lets Satan kill Job's ten children and make him sick. Moreover, even if Job is only a story, we unfortunately have met and we have heard of many people whose suffering was as bad as Job's suffering. Moving from the biblical era to our time, the idea of imminent God faces enormous <coughs> difficulties when considering the horrible events of genocides in Auschwitz and in other places all over the world. And again, the only way to justify it is by claiming that we, human beings, cannot understand the ways God operates our world. The bottom line of this point of my talk is that the secular thinking is much simpler than the believer's thinking since he doesn't have to cope with all the above mentioned problems. This is not a call to believers to abandon their belief. Sometimes when I discuss these issues with my <coughs> students, some of them try to convince me that God exists. A common argument for Islamic students is the Quran is so beautiful that only God can write such text. Since this is claimed in a science education course, I remind my students that in science, we have to examine all the time competing hypotheses. Thus, a simple competing hypothesis to the last one is that some human beings have such a wonderful literary talent that they can write such a beautiful text as the Quran. This, of course, does not convince them. They stick to the, they stick to their belief, and I stick to mine. Another proof for the existence of God is like the following: Consider things around you, furniture, buildings, car, etc. All of them were constructed by someone. Is it possible that the entire world was not created by somebody? Unfortunately, also this proof is not valid. It is impossible to conclude from the fact that a table is constructed by a carpenter that also the world has a creator. Such conclusion is to assume what you want to prove. In the history of the theological debates about the existence of God, there, there is a story about a debate between Euler, the religious, and Diderot, the atheist. This debate was initiated by Catherine the Great, the Tsar of Russia. A religious lady was disturbed by the French atheist movement. She invited Diderot, a philosopher and one of the main leaders of the atheist, atheistic movement to argue with Euler about the existence of God. Euler said, A plus B to the power of N over X equals X, therefore God exists. Diderot, whose mathematical knowledge was almost zero, realized he could not contradict Euler's <laughs> argument, and therefore he returned to Paris. <laughs> This anecdote tells us something about Euler. First, in order to win a debate, he did not avoid unfair means. <laughs> but moreover, being a mathematician, one of the greatest in mathematical history, he knew that what he said could not be a proof that God exists. Namely, he believed in God not because there was a proof that God exists, but because he chose to believe. There are more proofs for the existence of God. For instance, 
God appeared to me in my dream. Again, to my science education students who claim it, I say, can you suggest a competing interpretation to the fact that you have dreamt about God rather than the claim that God exists? Have you heard about Freud? Thus, when I try to convince my students that there's no proof for the existence of God, some of them don't believe me. Others who develop critical thinking understand. Is the belief in God becomes weaker when somebody realizes that there's no proof for his existence? I really don't know. However, in my opinion, the real question is not whether God exists. <coughs> the real question is whether God is needed. And the answer to this question is yes, with capital Y. <laughs> Everybody needs him, the religious as well as the atheists. For me, as an atheist, he is a metaphor, but I'm, o but I'm also inspired by a literary text in which God is the main figure. I'm inspired by the Bible, and I'm inspired by musical compositions as messes and requiems, some of which were composed by secular composers. By saying this, <coughs> I've almost <coughs> reached the end of my talk. I would like to summarize it by saying the following. As a secular science educator, I've tried to compare religious thinking to scientific <coughs> thinking. This is about the essential aspects of life. I have revealed my own thinking. My claims about the thinking of religious people on these issues are mere speculation. Hence, I would like to invite religious science educators to react to this <coughs> talk and to reveal their thinking about the above issues. Do it now in case there is time for it or send me an email. My email address is the following. And finally, an apology. I apologize for involving you with an unpleasant topic, our mortality. However, we face death almost every day. We go to funerals, we write wills, and so on and so forth. I believe that most of us cope with this fact by adopting Jean-Francois Villard's famous claim. C'est toujours euh, les autres qui meurent. <laughs> or in English, it's always the other people <laughs> who die. And with this happy note, let us return to our homes and families and enjoy, enjoy our life as much as we can. Thank you. <laughs> very much, Slavo. I, um, some people I know have to leave because they have class and other responsibilities, but I think we have, for those who can stay, um, time for some questions. But if you want to have a conversation afterwards, just come upstairs to our suite and uh, we can continue conversing with Slavo afterwards, anybody who wants to join us. Uh, now, anybody here to make a comment or ask a question? Do you have any quick thoughts about how modern uh, modern physics and Eastern religion seem to start to interweave in a way in the last hundred years? Because I think Eastern philosophy has about 3,000 years of uh, expertise that no one who seems to study Western religion ever touches. About uh, modern science, you mean astrophysics? Um, quantum mechanics, okay. entanglement. Okay, all right. So, so this is uh, um, it creates a question how uh, uh, our world was uh, was created, and uh, in, in Eastern religions, as a matter of fact, which is very interesting, uh, most of them have no god. I mean, in Buddhism, there's no god. 
in a field you uh, consider Confucius, which is not exactly religion, uh, th there's no God there. They relate only to things, uh, to, to human beings and the ways to make them, uh, yeah. But are, are you using God as a noun, or are you talking about God sort of more as a verb? Because I, I don't think that the the Western interpretation of Buddhism in the terms of God existing as a noun, I don't know if that's applicable. Like as if a thing exists, or a presence exists. It's well, God, God is uh, an entity, I don't know what... Uh, so do you say no, noun? I say noun, yes. And also, grammatically, God is a noun. You say God... Uh, God exists, God doesn't exist, so it's okay. a noun. Okay. That well, I think you have your... I don't know, like the Tao, would you call the Tao God in Taoism, or is that um, something different? I don't remember exactly now. I, I, I remember reading about Taoism, but I don't think that there's a... Is there a God there? Uh, See, see, this is the problem with the translation of these oh, languages. Okay, yeah, it's very okay. verb-based. So it's it's kind of a path or a journey or a mm -hmm. a long term way of mm -hmm. things always being. Yeah, it's it's not about a stagnant. It's here. Mm -hmm. It has a you know a consciousness. Okay. It's not. So that's a it's a very simplistic interpretation. Kind of like quantum mechanics. The you know the again particles are not these individual things. They are a probability of existence. And when you measure them, sometimes they're in a place mm -hmm. you expect. Sometimes they're not. Um, your active measurement or interacting with it actually creates it noun-like presence, but it's always a wave, which is much more of a verb. And that particle wave duality is something that I think is very well encompassed in non-Western religion. And I think that a lot of talk about this type of stuff always boils down to a Western interpretation of, of cosmogenesis. And in Eastern interpretation of it, it's it's a much more fluid concept that I I just urge you that like there's a lot to add to this that isn't in Western thought um, and much more like from Eastern traditions that, that are it's worth looking into. Is this uh, you you field of uh, expertise? Well, I did for a long ah, time. Okay, but you and I study. I, yeah. I study many religions, yeah. and I've always looked at ah, okay. the so terms. Or co you combine the two, yeah, okay. Yeah, so okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, okay. I have a yeah. question on a completely different view. You were talking about transcendental versus imminent God. The transcendental God, put everything together and said, you're on your own. <laughs> and, and, you know, you bring up things like Auschwitz, and, and you can take 9-11, and you can take the genocides all over the world, and people say, well, why didn't, why didn't God do something about that? And the answer is, well, people have free will, and God made all these people. And those people who God made decided that they were going to do this, and they have the free will to do it, versus an imminent God who should have stepped in and said, we're not going to make this happen. How do you respond to imminent God believers who try to give you an example of this is proof that God is an imminent God and did something on earth to step in? I, I think of people like saints who have performed I miracles and things like that. Okay. The, 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 you see, the, it's very interesting. I mean, in order to to prove that God exists, one should one should point at miracles. It's all. It started with with Moses, mm -hmm. and it went to uh, Elijah, and also to Jesus. I mean, uh, all, all the miracles. So, um, whereas the scientists could look at those miracles and say, well, this is why that happened. So, I, so you know stories. We don't know. We don't. We don't. We don't know anything about it. But it, it's interesting to, to, I think, in order to convince somebody, somebody, uh, that, that God exists, uh, you should uh, point at some miracles and say, okay, uh, this should convinces you. The only one, the only one, which did not need uh, uh, miracles was, was uh, you know, uh, Abraham. He, he did it by thinking, and then God appeared to him and told me, "Go, go!" And he did. He did ask for any miracles. So um, uh, now, I, I know people. Yes, I know people. Uh, mainly people who, who um, after a certain trauma, decided to 
to believe in God, but for me it's it's uh, quite annoying. For instance, uh, there were there were two persons in a car. There was, there was a car crash, and uh, the driver was killed, and the one who sat beside uh, him was saved. And he said, "You see, J God wanted to save me." And my question is, uh, so how do you explain that God wanted? To, to kill him. Uh, do you think you are better than him? So th this is, for me, it's our right, righteous uh, <laughs> uh, argument. But uh, I know uh, of, of several people who uh, who took this and, and uh, became religious. One last comment, and then I think we can go upstairs if you want to. Uh, John, John. Yeah. Um, so I have too many comments. But I'll well, you can go upstairs. Pick up, I'll pick up, <laughs> I'll pick up from here. Uh, because <laughs> I, I, whenever, whenever I hear of a uh, an airplane crash. I yeah. immediately shudder because I know there will be some people who will say God meant me to survive. And yeah. the obvious question is, yeah. did God? I was not lucky not to to be on this plane. I was I've scheduled, but then I was there. Yeah. All those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. So, so, so people have a sense of that. Now, one thing you sh sh you sh you're certainly aware of, and you should mention in this context, is the book by uh, um, uh, Rabbi Harold Kushner, which is called. Um, when bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote this book in response to a situation where his child had this very rare disease which involved growing old and dying within eight years or something like that. So he went through all the stages of life in a short amount of time. And the conclusion he comes to is that when faced with the contradiction between God as all good, beneficent God, and God is all-powerful, omnipotent God, that the two can't coincide. You can't believe in both at the same time. And he decides that he would rather give up the notion of God's omnipotence than give up the, God, the notion of God's benevolence. So that is to say that, uh, uh, he, that for him, uh, God does not intervene in these things, that part of God's uh, essential character is to allow room for humanity to develop itself. So God does not uh, heal one person and uh, allow another person to die, uh, although God would like that is the, the right outcome. But God's role in this is to join us in our weeping over the suffering that has been that has happened. So that's a very different perspective, but a very powerful one, I think.